an announcement of one event I was extremely sorry to miss. It was last winter's program, Blog to the Chief, and it brought together some of the nation's best political weblogers. Great program. Whose idea was this, I asked. You see, I know the people who run this place, and I knew it wasn't theirs. Uh, turns out it was this new guy, Dr. David Perlmutter, Associate Dean for Graduate Studies and Research at the William Allen White School of Journalism and Mass Communications here at KU. In addition to a background as a documentary photographer and the author of several books on political communication, he was in the midst of writing a book for Oxford University Press called Blog Wars, The New American Political Battleground. It was his idea. This evening's program is another of Dr. Perlmutter's brainchilds. I hope it will introduce many of you to one of the most dynamic corners of what our president called the internets. And for those of you who are consumers of military blogs, teach you a little bit about, wha about where they came from and how they're changing the way we fight. Uh, to introduce our panel tonight and to moderate, Dr. David A. Perlmutter. Thank you for being some of the proud and the few that decided to come out of this uh, cold evening here. Thank you, Jonathan Earl. Welcome to the Dole Institute, which I think is a, a temple of uh, bipartisan, spirited conversation here in, in Kansas. And I, I think it's one of the proudest uh, places in Lawrence, and everybody who sees it is really amazed. And the, the discourse that occurs here is also something to be proud of. Uh, I'm a professor at the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, and my approach here tonight is as a media historian. I, I wrote a book on the history of uh, the visualization of warfare going back to the uh, Stone Ages. That's where I brought this person from here. <laughs> <laughs> and and, um, I just finished a book on, on blogging. And when I wrote the book on, on war imagery, I came across a, a statement that was attributed to a Greek philosopher named Heraclitus. And he said thousands of years ago, war is the father of all things. And I have to say, unfortunately, I still agree with him today. Uh, we are who we are. We are sitting here. We are flying a, a particular flag. We hold particular beliefs. Or even our genetic makeup has been determined by who won and who lost wars. It's a very important issue. But lots of things are the children of war, technology being the foremost among them. If you go through the list of it, uh, the new, new gadgetry to new machines that have somehow been incited by the, the competition to do better in battle, it all comprises almost all the achievements of the human race. And it's sad, it's sad commentary in our civilization that, that that's so. The internet, as probably many of you know, began as a Defense Department project to safeguard America's command and control of communication networks in event of nuclear war. Well, fast forward about 30 years and living in this age of instant communication, I was watching television the very first days of the Iraq war and I saw an incident which I think sort of summed up the new world of technology. A young American Marine had been wounded and was in a field hospital and was being tended to. And he noticed that this was going on television. And he asked, was it live? And the television reporter said yes. And he said, well, I'm worried my mother is going to see this back home in Ohio. And by the time the Defense Department notifies her that I'm, I'm OK, I'm just slightly hurt, she's going to get worried. So somebody stand, handed him a satellite cell phone. And he called his mother to say, you know, I'm, gonna be, I'm on TV right now, but don't worry about it. I'm going to get better. That encapsulated a really a, a new world that we have f yet fully to explore. Now, it's obvious we live in an age where people get online and they express themselves, they express their inner feelings. I'm old enough to remember when a diary was something private. You, know, you didn't put it up on the web for everybody else uh, to see and to read and to enjoy. But that anybody can enter the conversation means literally that anybody can enter the conversation. I have a friend named Corey Dauber. She's a professor at University of North Carolina. And she tells the story of an American special forces unit that raided an insurgent stronghold in Iraq, Baghdad. And there was a firefight. They killed a number of insurgents. They liberated a civilian prisoner. But by the time they got back to base, other insurgents had gone to this area cleaned it up, made it look like the people there who were dead had been killed while peacefully at prayer, videoed it, and put it up on their website for the whole world to see the American atrocity. 
that's a kind of warfare that we're going to talk a little bit about tonight, but I don't think that large institutions like the United States government and, and uh, the Pentagon easily deploy uh, defenses or offenses uh, against. At the same time, one of the remarkable developments in the history of warfare is warriors reporting to us live from the front. And that's what we're talking about with the various species of military blogger. These are people, soldiers, sailors, Air Force personnel, and Marines, who are telling us, showing us in video, in pictures, what they're seeing and hearing at the front. Or they may be veterans at home commenting on military affairs. Whoever they are, whatever they are, they're changing the way that war is understood through what we used to call traditional media, and we don't really even know what to call it anymore. I'm very lucky to have a very distinguished panel today that will discuss these issues. Oops, sorry. That's a good, good one to start off with. <laughs> First injury here. Thanks. Medic? Okay. Uh, immediately to my right is John Donovan. John Donovan is a retired major of the Army Artillery whose mill blog is one of the most cited and viewed in the world. He lives here locally, but has been to the White House to meet President Bush, but also serves on Representative Nancy Boyd's Veterans and Military Affairs Advisory Council. To his right is Mr. Jack Holt. Jack Holt is Chief of New Media Operations at the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs. He's a Def Department of Defense civilian career employee and served in the National Guard with a number of international assignments. And then Mr. Ward Carroll is editor of Military.com, He's a retired commander who flew F-14s. So for those of you old enough to remember the movie Top Gun, you were Goose, not Tom Cruise not Maverick, Maverick, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. All right. We could cut that. And he was the winner of the Strike Flight Air Medal. He's a prolific author of fiction and nonfiction. In 2001, earned the Naval Institute Press's Author of the Year honor. He has also been described, depending on who I've talked to, as the, uh, either the godfather or the gray eminence behind the rise of military blogging. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Uh, John, I wanted to start with you. Some, give us a, a, a course in military blogging 101. Tell us, what is your mill blog? What does it consist of? What do you do to make it? Well, first off, it's a <coughs> platform to snark back at you. You're just jealous that I have hair. <coughs> the... Uh, I got started back in 2003, and it was mainly because I was watching mainstream media and or National Review Online. I was watching smart people on both sides of the aisle talking about what they saw on the news and drawing completely, to my mind, from my experience as a warrior, uh, incorrect conclusions. And I started feeding Jonah Goldberg information on that uh, topic. And he started publishing it, and so I got to see my words in glowing pixels on a screen and people actually responding positively to it. And my wife was tired of me breaking te televisions, and both of them said I should blog. So what's blogging? Blogging is a piece of software, a server to host it on, and something to say. And it's just it's really very simple to do. Any of you here can go home and in 20 minutes you can set up a free blog. The hard part is having something to say that people want to hear or read and, that, and providing them that content day after day after day so they'll keep coming back. And Most blogs last about three weeks and then you find out your mother's the only one reading it and then you're horrified at that. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not really sure too much more about what he was after without me going into this long story about how I became a blogger other than that's the Reader's Digest. We can read that in your blog. How's that? <laughs> exactly. That's, that's trying cool. to I, we do want to hear that story. Ward, I, I just wanted whether you could give us a sort of short, short history of the rise of mill blogging. Where did it come from? Why is it here? Well, I mean, the first part was the technology was there. Like John said, you know, WordPress, um, Blogspot, all these other these freeware blogware programs where anybody can get a URL and uh, and start blogging, right? But the other thing that contributed particularly to the rise of political blogs and mill blogs is the national, both dialectic and the the, the, the polarizing elements that have that have 
surrounded current events, whether it's the war or whatever's gone on since 9-11. So as John described, the impetus that brought him to blogging was people, to his mind, were getting it wrong. Traditional media outlets were getting it wrong. So that's what happened around mill blogging. Now, mill blogging in its most empirical essence is warriors writing about their experiences uh, from the front with, without any political uh, bent. Um, but what has grown from there are, uh, when you say the ages of mill bloggers, it includes sort of de facto pundits like John. It includes spouses that have done virtual outreach to other spouses, uh, all kinds of things. So it's, it's grown because the, the environment has demanded that it grows. Do we have any numbers of, say, how many blog, no bloggers there are? You have, what, set 12, 12 more, less, just slightly less than 2,000? How many? No, no, no. no I mean, if millblogging.com is, is sort of the nexus of, of blogging, I mean, he has 20,000 registered mill bloggers. Um, but again, as John says, uh, the ability to be a known mill blogger, to be a mill blog celebrity, if you will, like John, um, is. Uh, is what discriminates, you know, it's just it's the marketplace, right? It's a virtual marketplace, but can you, it's a non-trivial challenge to say, can you write something day in and day out that, that demands to be read, you know? And that's where some guys are known in the mill blogosphere and others are, are not. Jack, could mm -hmm. you give us a little history of the, the Department Defense, of Defense's view of mill blogging? I mean, this is a, a very large organization you work for. <laughs> And while blogging, the essence of blogging is, is really we, we tend to have individual expression, the thoughts of one person without a filter, without checking with the command structure, just expressing oneself to, to, the, to the ether and hoping that, uh, that somebody's going to listen besides you know, the blood relatives. Could you talk about your relationship with mill blogging? Certainly. Um, when you ask about what the Department of Defense is, uh, thoughts or ideas on that, it's hard to say because it runs the gamut because there are those who are in full favor of, of letting soldiers talk, tell their own stories, to those who are so new to this, they don't understand it, they don't know how it works. It's all punditry and it's, it, we've got no business there. And in, in between there, there is going to be a, a melding of technologies, minds, uh, communication, so that what will eventually transpire is what the nation needs to be informed about what one of its most significant assets is doing in the Department of Defense, the military in the military affairs. And what my charge has been is to find ways to engage in that, find ways to add value to the national discourse, the, the national debate on the things that are surrounding the, the, the operations that we're involved in. And so when you, you know, when I started looking at this. Uh, I was deployed to Afghanistan. Uh, my charge there was to put reporters downrange with our military troops. Uh, let them report, embed them with these troops, let them report from the front. The problem was nobody wanted to go because it's hard to report from the front in Afghanistan when you don't have power. You can't, you can't talk to people. There's no phones. The cell, you know, everything, it, it is so remote, there's just no way to really communicate and the fact that if you're going to go down, you're going to probably be gone you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 days if you're going to get any kind of story out of the thing, simply because it's difficult to get there. So as we were watching this, I was watching the rise of the blogosphere and the potentials that, was, that were there. But in 2004, 2005, it was difficult to figure out how, how to grasp this. It, it was becoming something, but nobody really knew what. When I came back and I, I, I took the job at the Department of Defense, we started seeing some of this solidify. People like John, people like military. Military.com, I'd been, I'd been reading since about 2000, 2001. I, I, had, I was fully aware of what they were doing, but blogging was a new kind of uh, essence to this. So <clears throat> I started seeing areas where maybe I could be of value to this. Uh, CENTCOM put out a, a best practices. What they had been doing was searching the internet, finding people out there that were posting on things that, had, that were concerning military affairs, and they would just, you know, they would have a soldier sitting there that would, that would post back to it, to a blog and say, you know, we see that you're writing on these subjects, you're not quite right on this, let me link you to our site and to our information, 
and you know, the, basically the source documentation. Uh, so I took their, their best practices, I started talking to bloggers, I started searching out some of these things, and I started emailing bloggers saying, what can I do? How can I add value to what you're doing? And the one thing they asked was to get access. And that's, that was what got us started. There have been a lot of studies done of political bloggers, which I've been interested in up to now. And uh, you can do these uh, profiles, demographic, sociographic, psychographic, that yes, uh, overwhelmingly people who read political blogs tend to be more educated, tend to be more white, tend to be more up, upper income. They, they fall under this category of influential that people who would be people who would be in, probably involved in politics anyway. There have been a very interesting development this year with Barack Obama's campaign. And a, you could argue already some evidence of a very effective use of social media like MySpace and Facebook and, and, and YouTube and, and some other campaigns as well. Um, if you had to give us a profile, and I know that any sentence that all military bloggers are this is inherently incorrect, but maybe all three of you could offer some sort of general if it possibly was a general profile of who military blogs and why. Yeah, that's, that's a challenge. Uh, when it initially started, it was guys like Matt Burden of Black Five, myself, guys who'd been out of the military, retired, or in Matt's case, he just got out, and who had uh, <clears throat> didn't like what we saw and heard in the media, either from a they're lying about it to the they're just not telling the stories side of it but it it just it grew uh, virally and you had like Colby Kosh a young soldier uh, who writes very well uh, what Scott Beauchamp wished he was uh, and the young troops they were able to get their word out and then the army suddenly realized uh oh there's a lot of stuff going out that does violate OPSEC and so those guys kind of went away for a while as the Army shut that down by cranking down the bandwidth and slowing people up and making it scary. And then what you had then was more guys stateside. But you got a, a few big voices like Sergeant Hook and Greyhawk. They're both active duty bloggers. Matt at Black Five, themilitary.com. And we, they created an environment that allowed people to uh, feel safe in doing this. And then you, those spouses started coming up, like we have Amy Proctor here, who blogs, initially blogged in support of her husband, so to speak, and now just blogs in support of soldiery. And uh, but they're, we're on the gamut. Uh, we've got parents who are mill bloggers, parents of deployed kids. We have children of deployed parents who blog. We've got the soldiers who blog. The group that is probably most underrepresented amongst the active duty, and this is not a shock, are the officers. Uh, the NCOs, the troops blog, and the retired officers who are beyond retribution for the most part blog. But, uh, that would be. Uh, I mean, if following the rules of the question, let me just try to identify one guy, right? Um, so, regardless of affiliation or status, it's somebody who is displeased with what he's seeing in the arena in terms of fact. Displeased to the point that he's willing to put his thoughts you know, on virtual paper. So whether that's an active duty warfighter or a retired uh, you know, guy who's got a day job, um, it doesn't matter. It's, it's somebody with, a mil with, with military affiliation and military affinity that is displeased with the way that the national narrative is is happening yeah and that doesn't necessarily mean displeased with how the war is going or who's doing what to whom but what you said is, is they don't see their story out there they don't see their child's story out there they don't see their parents story out there or like me they just see inaccurate information and just kind of want to go well, could you give but us wait. an example those are both and in your biography when you sent it to us you said one of your main motivations was you felt there were stories that weren't being told and they were facts that were incorrect that you could you could offer some some facts that better um, maybe if you could give us some examples of where a mill blogging an individual or community fact check corrected an error that was in mainstream media or brought uh, some additional knowledge to a story that you felt was not being covered by traditional media 
Well, I mean, the most extreme example lately is the Scott Beecham story. Um, I don't know if everybody remembers, but some weeks ago or some months ago, um, there was a guy blogging under a pseudonym, the Baghdad Diarist, who was relating incredible stuff about soldiers using human skulls as a soccer ball and swerving Humvees to run over dogs during patrols and uh, making fun of a, a female soldier who had her face was disfigured by an IED in a common area, a mess hall. And so um, a guy named uh, Michael Goldfarb at the Weekly Standard was reading this, and he was just sort of you know, amazed that this one guy in the space of some months could have all these experiences. And it just struck him in the gut as this, this can't be accurate. So he reached out to the mill bloggers. And it was sort of an all call that he sent out with the links to these stories in case people hadn't seen them at the New Republic. And at that point, the mill blogosphere went into action. And the action was very stoic. It was about reaching out to sources that were proprietary and a function of relationships in your Rolodex, if you will. And the evidence started to come in, long story short, that Scott Beecham was a fabulist, if you will, right? Which is he made every one of these stories up. And it's just like that broken glass, or shattered glass, or that, that movie is again about the New Republic. Um, and uh, so little by little, the mill blogosphere started to create this wave that, to be quite honest, traditional media was hesitant to accept as true. Certainly the New Republic wasn't about to accept it. Um, so they fought it, and finally, Scott Beecham was faced with his own conscience and the own fact, the, the own fact that he was persona non grata in his, in, among his peers and in his command structure. So he admitted he'd made it all up. And he was actually fashioning his, his, himself a job at the New Republic after he got out of uniform. It turns out his wife was a fact checker for the New Republic, um, which is you know, hugely ironic. So absent the mill blogosphere, these facts don't come to light. They absolutely don't come to light. Never mind, it takes a long time for them to come to light. They don't come to light. So there's a, a recent example of where the blogosphere has corrected the record in a timely fashion and did it in a way that wasn't, um, was very stoic. You know, it was very matter of fact. Just gathering facts, presenting facts, and forcing the fabulous to recant his story and thereby forcing traditional media to admit that in this case the editor of the New Republic did not even come close to doing his job. And uh, I, I have two examples. The uh, Castle Arc, we, we rose to the prominence we've attained, such as it is, um, with Rathergate. My co-blogger, Dusty, who is a retired A-10 pilot, <clears throat> and I got involved in the verification or misauthentic the lack of authentication on the forged documents largely by Dusty having a trove of those documents from that era printed on those machines in order that we provided the people who were uh, the type the typographers and other those experts that's the other thing about the, the blogs is you can synthesize a lot of very specialized uh, expertise quickly and the linkages to us from that and our participation, that's kind of what raised us up uh, an instapundent link, doesn't hurt. Uh, the other thing, and this is how I came to uh, in contact with Dave, was during the, Lebanon, the invasion of Lebanon by Israel two years ago and the Palestinian photography, FAUX. And I was one of the people involved in pointing out the artifacts and the elements involved and why those photographs uh, were clearly photoshopped, etc. I just wish I was the guy who had discovered Flat Fatima. But for those of you who remember the the lady who just appears in all these photographs, uh, the same position all this time. And then another thing I did, and this again, uh, Dave and I talked about, was a, uh, and this is kind of an information operation, so to speak, where they had photographs coming out of Pakistan of what was reputed to be a U.S. Army, a U.S. military missile that had taken out a house. And this isn't the wedding party one, but it's something similar to that. And they have this grizzled old uh, Paki tribesman 
with his hand around what is reputed to be this missile, and I can look at it and just go, that's a 155 millimeter artillery projectile, or a 152, something similar to that. And it's been fired, and it was clearly a dud. And I did a little research, and I figured out that it was marked as the Pakistanis mark their ordinance, and it was likely fired by the Pakistani army about two weeks prior who had been fighting in that area. But the AP was reporting as fact that this was the U.S. Mil military missile that was fired that killed these civilians. Um, leave aside the fact that it was an unexploded piece of ordnance, but <clears throat> that actually got me a short gig with the CNN producer to check that kind of stuff for them. Uh, then apparently that was unpopular that she was saying, but it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, and she got fired. Um, I don't take credit nor blame for that, but those are similar kinds of things. Well, when you talk about uh, who is a mill blogger, uh, you, you take a you take a step and say, you know, okay, so what is the mill blogosphere? And it's it's those people who are gathered around the idea of military affairs. They they've got an affi affinity for it. They've got a, they've got a background in it. They've got a they've got for some reason they're drawn to that information. And this is what we find from my perspective. We see this happening out there in in the blogosphere, in the in the in the in the Ethernet, the internet, across the board. The blogosphere is just not one place. It's several places that make up the blogosphere. The military sphere is just one of them. So if you want information on the military, you can go there, and you can put that up against what you've been reading in the, you know the New York Times, the Washington Post, the USA Today, what you see on CNN, and you can say, okay, well I've got all of that stuff. I want to go here and see what these guys have to say about it and give you some balance on the information that you're, you're bringing in. So if you want to know, it's out there. And that's what we see developing. And, and if you look at the Internet as one publication, the mill bloggers are like the military beat reporters. They're out there. They've got a background. They've got, they, can put, they take these complex, uh, this, these complex uh, ideas, concepts, and operations and reduce it down into information that people can actually understand because they've got that background in it. They can make that communication leap. So you know, from our perspective, that's kind of the way we see a lot of this developing. I interviewed a, a couple of months ago uh, Scott Kesterson, who is uh, video blogging from, from Afghanistan with, um, I believe, one of the, Air, the Airborne? Actually, he was with the Oregon Mountain. National Guard. No, no, National Guard. And uh, he's produced a number of videos and, and just a, a large amount of material. Now, once upon a time, there was a species of person called a foreign correspondent. And this person would go to some exotic land far away where we couldn't possibly travel or see, and they'd write letters back about what's going on with the king in, in uh, the Fez. And, and those letters would get back to London, you know, maybe two weeks later, and that's what, how we would learn from that one person uh, how what was going on there. The, probably one of the world's most famous journalists, William Howard Russell, reporting on the Crimean War, uh, overturned the government because of his reports of the terrible conditions of the soldiers and the ineptness of, of the general. So the old press model is of that individual going someplace where, where few others could go to report on the war to the home front. Now we have potentially everybody, you know, 10,000 soldiers or, or, or Marines in a particular area, all having the ability to report. Are we entering an era where the mill blogger will simply replace the, the war reporter, or is it, is it a complementary relationship, or is it they're, they're each fact-checking each other, or we're learning I, more? You know, we've, we've kind of had this discussion off and on at different, er, uh, different times over the past couple of days, with Ward and I in particular. You know, let's take another step back. What do you think would have been the first high-speed Internet as such for its time? Roman roads, hard service Roman roads. All of that technology that the military has brought has built civilizations, has helped build communication, has helped in the development of societies. But they all come over time. They all have their problems. They all have their growing pains. And these are some of the things that, that we're dealing with now. Uh, will they replace the, the foreign correspondent or the down downrange reporter? I hope not because we need independent witnesses down there. Um, you know, for example, and I've made this comment earlier in one of the classes today, 
you know, when you look at the Constitution of the United States, there's really only two professions that are spelled out as necessary for liberty and freedom and our way of government, for democracy. And in our Constitution, those two things are the press, the freedom of the press, and the military. There's, there's this almost symbiotic relationship that, that continues. Um, and that friction is good. Ward has talked about the, the friction that exists, the tension that exists. That is a good thing. So will they replace it? I hope not. But one of the interesting things about it is if you look at the, well, for example, you, as if, if the media is the fourth estate, if they are the watchdogs, who's holding the chain? So in that scenario, what we have here, and, and this is something that's still developing. We still haven't quite figured out exactly how it is, and it may be a combination of both things. If you know the first estate is the clergy, the second estate is the nobles or the government, and the third estate are the people, the fourth, fourth estate being the media is the new media, the fifth estate, to kind of help write check on what's actually being reported. Or is it an empowered third estate? Because now the people have the power to publish, which has been the barrier to entry over history. Having that power to publish, it is now, in, in our country, commonplace. All you have to do is go to the library and log on. So what is that dynamic going to bring us? We don't know. Should we ignore it at our own peril? Uh, should we engage in the dialogue? Absolutely. Which is why we're here tonight, why we've been here to the... At, you know, speaking to journalism students, speaking to military uh, ROTC students, they're the ones, what's new media to us is not new media to them. This is a whole new dynamic that we as, not only as an organization, as the Department of Defense, as the government of the United States, but as the people of the United States have to figure out what it is we want out of this. And that's, what's, that's, that's kind of where we see this developing. Um, a few years ago, it's about 2001, the publishing industry freaked out about the idea that there could be self-publishing. You may remember Stephen King offered his novel for some amount, and if he got it, he continued to push chapters, and he didn't get what he wanted, so he, he, he just bailed on the idea. Um, that's sort of what your question is about, is if, if you give every warfighter a blog, um, how is he going to reach an audience? And how is the audience going to discriminate between two guys in a squad? Who's the guy you want to listen to? And that's where the fourth estate um, isn't going anywhere. And so the challenge to the American public and the consumer of media is to be discriminating about which of those, or to be varied about which of those you, you, know, you, you listen to or you watch. Um, and only there are you going to get the full story. But, you know, I mean, I have this discussion with people like Tom Ricks all the time. Tom Ricks, the Washington Post, Pulitzer Prize winning. And, and, you know, I'm a big fan of blogs, obviously, and I'll show him some posts. And he'll go, okay, that's great. That guy knows what he's doing there in Al Anbar or, you know, Anbar province or, or wherever. But he doesn't know how this fits in the whole. He doesn't know how to contextualize this for an audience where they can understand are we winning or losing. And I think there's some truth to that. Um, so unless you have a super discriminating, very tech-savvy reader who can bookmark a whole bunch of different blogs and aggregate them in a, in a way that gives you that context, and most of us are too lazy to do that, uh, you know, NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox, are, they're not going anywhere. And I think that's okay. I, I want to ask a personal question. Uh, here at the University of Kansas, uh, social psychology was one of the, the great... Uh, areas of research in the 40s and 50s. My field of mass communication was actually founded starting around World War II, trying to explain mass persuasion of publics in Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia, uh, trying to look at American soldiers, the famous studies of, of World War II GIs. These Americans who'd suddenly been thrown into this global war, they know Pearl Harbor was attacked by Vietnam, but they really don't know a lot of facts, like, say, where Japan is on a map, or they're, they're learning 
and these surveys are done of them to try to understand what will motivate them. And a lot of the research found that as, as you know, it, it is no great, would not be an insight to Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar is that men fought for other men next to them. The, 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 the small band of brothers, the platoon, was the main impetus to people surviving unbelievable harsh conditions and, and going on and, and fighting every day. Loyalty among the small group, the group dynamic. Does one of the big questions about social media is, you know, if, if you does that replace going online? Does that replace social bonding? And there's been a big controversy about that about our society. Whether if everybody goes online, nobody is going to be a Cub Scout and just or go for a walk with their 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 wife. Do, do you get a sense from uh, let's just say frontline war bloggers, people on who are in the combat zone and blogging, does that increase their sense of community? Does it give them any personal satisfaction to, to express themselves? Are, are they, they're, they're obviously getting some benefit out of it, but could you help us by defining that? Anyway. Well, I, I know that mill bloggers, when they come back stateside, miss their personality online. Um, and uh, so I don't know if that means that they're antisocial or they, they've plugged into this virtual arena at the expense of interacting with those around them. Um, but I do know that they, especially when they have an audience, and an audience, I mean, the thing about a blog is the post is just the first part, right? Then everything else is the comments. Um, so you post, hey, we just had this mission, or it's Christmas time, and, and here we have this little tree, and here's a picture of my tree, and um, that sort of thing. And everybody's like, hey, keep it going. You know, we love what you're doing, and, and here's my uh, link to you. I did a little dedication, and here's a song, and I just gave you an iTunes gift certificate, and whatever else, right? So this becomes sort of your online family. Um, so when you come back stateside and you, have no, you no longer have the, you know, the sizzle to, to have a blog that people are going to read, I know that they miss it. I mean, I've, I've seen guys that just go away. You know, they wither and die, figuring that nobody cares about their stateside life, and probably nobody does, right? So, yeah, I think it becomes part of you. It's a, it's a creative thing. Um, you online become this thing unto itself, right? I am the armorer. The uh, the online community that Cast Large has built, I treasure those people. I have now friends who are kindred spirits in Australia, New Zealand, Germany, Sweden, Russia, Turkey, Syria, um, <coughs> as well as SCADs in Canada, England, and the United States. The uh, But <coughs> soldiers are always going to have that bond. What this does, it allows them to share that bond a little wider and to hook up with other people, but more importantly, and at the same time a management problem for the government, is it brings their families into it, it brings their stateside friends into it, if they're good, especially if they're good bloggers, and it allows America to see and get to know their army in ways that only Ernie Pyle was letting them do before. And uh, <clears throat> it actually, uh, and for the guys who can maintain it, it, it actually helps them from retreating into the shell. I've got several friends who are freshly redeployed, and we're all pounding on them as they're going through their early two months back PTSD twinges. And uh, the blogs have, have made that awareness much, much greater. Uh, it has made it much easier for guys to admit they may not be blogging, but they read about guys like them who admit they're having these problems. And it has actually, in some respects, made it much easier for we stoic warrior types to at least admit amongst ourselves, yeah, I'm having bad days, really bad days. And in that respect, I think it is a net good, much as it might present the government some is issues about people who want to look at it the other way going oh look at how horrible all this is reality is that that has always been there yeah. so now we're being more open and dealing with it right and and it, another interesting aspect of that communication is that traditionally and for especially over the past 60 years or so we've been taught in we've been taught mass communication and really one way messaging and, and especially for those of us that grew up with TVs in our homes, uh, you know, 
the TV became an entertainment source, it also became something that your mother could sit you in front of and then go about and do her business. So you were, you had this one-way interaction. You go to, you go to school. You sit in class. You are taught. This is in mass communication and in in public affairs. You have something to say. What's the best way to reach a lot of people? You call up the New York Times. You put out a press release. You call a press conference. You boom, it's out there. Let them handle it from there. There's that distance that you have in that communication. The internet and the blogs, in particularly, are a very personal conversation. You have this personal relationship with who's on the other end. And that is a whole new dynamic in this. Probably also one of the reasons why it was readily accepted by children as they were growing up. And when that, when that, that social media became available, now they had a voice. You know, I'm not listening to my, you know, to my mom and my dad saying, sit down, shut up, and do what you're told. I can actually say something. I can actually, I have something to say, and there are people out here who are willing to listen to me. And that was, a, that was a new dynamic in this. They readily took to it because it gave them a freedom they didn't have before. Technology wasn't necessarily there prior to. But if you look back through history, you know, kids growing up, they hit their teen years, they get on the telephone, you can't get them off. Uh, same kind of dynamic, except this is more of a personal communication on a massive scale rather than mass communication as we know it. So from a government standpoint, from a public affairs standpoint, this is a whole new dynamic. We have to figure out how this is going to work, what, where can we add value to this, what is it that, that uh, we can expect out of this, and what does the American public expect out of us in this manner, which is as these children grow up, as they become uh, voters, as they become citizens and working adults, what are they going to expect? How are they going to expect us to communicate with them? So those are things that we're, we're looking at right now. Uh, how does this work? What can we do to be better? We have a little time left before we open up for questions. I want to ask one big macro controversial question that we've sort of danced around a, a, a little bit. Um, there was some social surveying done during the Korean War, but basically the Vietnam War is the first war where we had just extensive surveying of public opinion on, on the war. And one of the interesting facts that came out of that is that you had to learn how to ask the question, because if you ask people, you know, are, do you support or oppose the war, that wouldn't give you a very informed answer unless you asked them what they meant by that. And the, a substantial part of the, the, the electorate, the public, were saying that they opposed the war in the way it was being fought. In other words, they were opposed to Richard Nixon's war or Lyndon Johnson's war, that they actually constituted a hawk anti-war movement, that they, they thought, they should, well, we should fight harder to win. Uh, to what extent is it fair to say that a lot of no-bloggers constitute either an anti-war anti, anti -war movement, as I see expressed in many you know, antipathy towards the public anti-war movement, in, the, in the, and again, you can't stereotype all no-bloggers, or that they constitute a critique of the war, but from a different direction than what we traditionally associate as, a, as an anti-war movement. Is that a compl too complicated an academic question? I'm sorry, but let's try. I'll sign up for being uh, the critique. Uh, <clears throat> I was not in favor of invading Iraq, uh, a position not necessarily universally held by the people who like me and read me. Um, but we agree to disagree on that. Nor did I like, and I had some inside sources, nothing high level. Um, I was perturbed, uh, especially the historian, the military historian in me was perturbed by what I perceived as the lack of post-combat planning that had gone on. In fact, it went on, it just wasn't accepted. Uh, but I was also fully of the opinion, we broke it, we got to fix it. And my guys, guys I know, guys I train, guys I brought up, uh, guys I pushed up, are over there doing it, and I got to help them too. And I was not shy about expressing my opinion on, on how things were being done and how I thought things could be done differently. But at the same time, I'm always caveating it by saying, I'm here. I'm not sitting in the talk of JTF 82. 
in Kandahar uh, seeing what they see. And, uh, but it's offering a little more informed a critique of how operations are going on and avoiding the personal attacks that comprise the political side of things. And I am, uh, I'm a child of the Vietnam War. My dad fought in that war, was wounded five times. He managed to stop four of those notifications, one got through. <clears throat> so I was the kid standing at the door with my mother with the Western Union guy on the other side of the door. We don't know what it is. My mother is paralyzed by that. And I'm the guy who reads, I'm the 12-year-old who reads the message and finds out that dad's been wounded, not too bad. Um, and my mother collapses. So I have a very visceral understanding of the impact on families and the impact on soldiers of what you're talking about. And that's why I set my voice to be, you know, <clears throat> to get the truth out as I saw it. And I fully recognize that five different people looking at the same thing, it's five different truths. But <clears throat> the impact that the calls that my mother took that were vile and that kind of stuff, I, it wasn't going to happen on my watch as much as I could handle it. And so, but at the same time, I wasn't going to let, you now, <clears throat> Harold Johnson, uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who was very unhappy about the war, uh, who, he's the guy who threatened to resign, take the Chiefs with him, and chose not to do it. And when he died, before he died, he said he, the decision he regretted the most was not, I was going to try and hold Rumsfeld and other people's feet to the fire on that issue. You know, if you're going to do this, do it right. And that means... If what you're doing isn't working, do something else. Well, I think the answer to that question is a function of what part of the war are you talking about. I think the mill blogosphere, and this is going to be sort of a gross generalization, but from the invasion till the midterms, the mill blogosphere was categorically on board with the mission as being waged by Rumsfeld. And woe be unto him who would judge otherwise. Now, what happened at the midterms is, and, and I'm, I'm trying to be non-parochial here, non-partisan. Non, uh, um, at the midterms, the Democrats rode into town thinking they had a mandate for precipitous withdrawal. The American people, as you said, David, they, they didn't want to lose, right? They didn't like the way the war was being fought, but they didn't want to lose. So that's where mill bloggers sort of became, how did you describe it, an anti-war hawk, right? I mean, is that the, the, the phrase you use? That, so from the midterms till now, that's how they've postured themselves, is, you know, thank God for uh, the surge, thank God for Atreus, thank God for the counterinsurgency best practices that we're doing. Um, so those are the, t you know, so I think that's, that's, the way that the, the mill blogosphere has, has played out over the, the long haul. Two different, distinctly two different um, voices that changed at the midterm. Well, from our perspective, what we have been, what our mission has been to do is to put as much factual information forward to allow this debate to go on in the public sphere, in the public square. To let, if you know, the political d debates aside, as an organization, the United States military uh, is apolitical. Now, there are, there are people who have political opinions, but as an or organization, it, it, we are apolitical. We work for whoever you guys elect. Now, in that, what we want to do is make sure that the American public is as informed as they, uh, they can be, and from a public affairs standpoint, to give them all the information that we possibly can to allow that public debate to take place. Because it's not our decision, it's yours. So, and that's kind of where we come from, from at, at the Department of Defense. And the blogs serve as a conduit for you to get around the gatekeepers? Well, I, I wouldn't say that, but everybody, for example, everybody has an agenda. But what we do, by being able to put the stuff up there, by being able to, to put information out there in you know, in its most raw form, but in actuality, on the internet, because we're all, we're producing most of this information anyway for internal audiences, for to talk to about different prog programs, projects, and things that are happening out there, and through what we do with the, the bloggers roundtable, 
There are things that just don't rise to the story, rise to the level of news for the New York Times. But if we've got a commander downrange who's got something he wants to talk about, and there are bloggers out here who want to know about it, we can hook those guys up. You know, a simple telephone call, we'll put them together, put it, give them a forum of which to discuss these things. Then we will re-record that, we get a transcript of it, so it's all, it's all out there, it's, all, it's transparent, we can possibly make it. And if we post that, and then the bloggers will write whatever they're going to write. And that, that discussion is going to happen out there in the, public, in, the, in, you know, in the public realm. But at least they're working up the same information. You're, you're able to resource something that is you know, Department of Defense information. Here is what the man said. So yeah, that's, that's, that, was our, that was our piece of this. This is what we were trying to do to add to that public discussion. In your value added, though, from the media perspective, is you make those guys available and you post the raw data. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to read what I think about it. Because when I write about those, because I participate in those interviews, I put a link to the transcript so that you can go make your own choices. You can go and see through your filters what it is, and whereas Tom Ricks doesn't publish that stuff. Um, and lots of good reasons. I, I just chose him because he's the one we'd mentioned recently and came up, not picking on Mr. Ricks. <clears throat> but it's just the difference between how bloggers approach things versus how mainstream media approaches things. And I'm not one who thinks that bloggers are going to replace them. I think we are complementary and supplementary. Mm -hmm. They still are the big dogs. They're the resources. <clears throat> what we get to do is fill in the blanks and add context that they don't have the time or column inches to do. Right. And it also provides a, a, a research resource for them. For example, Tom Ricks is going to go out and write a story. He's going to go, he's going to do some background research. He's going to look for data on it before doing his interview. And if all that information is out there in some form or fashion, it's available to him to do his research, to better inform him on how he wants to ask his questions so, and, and to conduct his interview. So it, it, is, <clears throat> it is all complementary. You know, it, it, it's all working you know, for the benefit of, the, of information for the American public. I guess uh, just a final word before we open up for, for questions. One, one of the functions of a university is that at least for four years and maybe a couple years of graduate school, people are forced to listen to things that they disagree with sometimes, what a professor is saying or a book they're assigned to read. And uh, that's really one of the functions of a liberal arts education. It's a natural predilection of human beings to seek out feedback that fits. We want to hear ourselves be told that, that we're right. but. It seems to me that you're all advising, as, as I hear the political bloggers did when the left and right political bloggers who were here uh, last year, is that the best way to use the blogosphere is to look around, is to find people who disagree with each other, fi find arguments going on, weigh the evidence yourself, look things up, don't just accept them. I'm, I'm a teacher, and so I, you know, I, I've seen papers where a student came back with some very fantastic fact and the footnotes said the internet you know, and <laughs> part of our function here is over the course of four years to convince them that the internet is not a source it is a uh, seabed where there's Spanish doubloons and then there's sharks and there's you know, poisonous <laughs> eels and they've got to learn as part of becoming a, a mature citizen of a democracy to differentiate and so I think that applies to mill blogs as much we now like to open up for questions we have some great student volunteers who have microphones and please signal to them they will hand you the microphone. We have a gentleman over here. Uh, yes, sir. Gentlemen, um, has there been any or do, are you aware of any, any situations where the command structure has been able to use the information that's flowing out of, the, out of these blocks to improve their responses to the situation that they have in front of them, whether it's better uh, better ability to control the insurgencies or better ability to basically that comes down to yeah is, is there any are the blogs giving the, the command structure 
any ability to better respond to the situation? Well, I'll field that one first because I just was working, at a, I was just at a workshop at the Army War College two weeks ago working on those very on those very things there is a recognition that there is value added in this there is value in this discussion there are things that are out there and it is you know, this is this is an area in which there should be engagement because in the blogosphere in this web 2.0 social media world that's what it's about is engagement you know, dialogue holding that conversation so there is a recognition. There's still uh, not a full understanding of what we can do with it, but there is a recognition that this is something we need to be engaged in. We just need to figure out how to do that. Well, I think the short answer to your question is no. Um, what you're talking about is Intel fusion, right? If you were talking about something where it was a 360 feedback thing, where somebody's uh, a CO realizes he's being a bit draconian or something, I would say maybe. But if you're talking about tactical feedback and using bloggers to figure out how to fight the insurgency, I would say that's a different mechanism. You know, the, the mill bloggers have not uh, been a means by which the, that the war is fought. And I'll caveat what he said. Uh, in that He's correct for real time, but in terms of, for example, the evolution of the counterinsurgency manual written up here at Leavenworth, you had Small Wars Journal, Belmont Club, several blogs which served as discussion fora in which authors of the, that man, manual, skilled practitioners such as uh, the Australian Lieutenant Colonel David Kilcullen, et cetera, were engaged in substantive conversations that involved direct feedback loops from ongoing operations. But if you're talking about, <clears throat> I'm in Fallujah going block by block, no. None of the guys doing that have the time, and they're not looking that way. But when you talk about iterative changes and evolution, yes, uh, there are some blog sites and there is some stuff going on inside of Army Knowledge Online internally to the services or in DKO, Defense Knowledge Online, where those kinds of conversations and that kind of impact is being seen. But it's nothing dramatic like I think your question was kind of hoping for. Be patient. <laughs> Do we know how many people uh, actually read blogs on a regular basis for serious uh, reasons, you know, not just to see what other kids are doing? Well, I mean, we let me answer the first half of the question is we know how many people read blogs because you get unique visitors and page views. Um, and then you can tell the the seriousness quotient by the, the tenor of the comments that are made. So among all, and the, and the amount of them, right? I mean, we have a blog that I'm very active in called defensetech.org, where if you post something about body armor, I guarantee you you're going to have 60 comments. Um, if you post something about NASA, you're going to have two. Um, so, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, and when you aggregate all those metrics, you can probably give it a qualitative value, which is the second half of your statement there. Is it, is it a quality discussion? You know, and so I think, yeah, the answer is yes, we, we know. Which blog are you talking about? Well, for example, I'll go over three million visitors next, next week sometime. Uh, when I am covering things that are big in the news, that are the, or a rash across Google, for example, I'll get five, six, ten thousand 10,000 visits a day. And that's unique visits. That's not the, that's not the guys who come back because I post throughout the day. But those are 10,000 unique IPs showed up and looked at my site for some reason. Uh, but some of those are Google. Uh, some of those are people who just stumbled in, which is okay because about 3% of those stay. Um, a different metric, and this is the one I do because I I write for influence as much as I do the other stuff. And so I look to see who reads me. And dot .state, dot .gov, all of the House and Senate servers, whitehouse.gov, OSD, probably Jack, um, you know, uh, va.gov, 
and because of my gun interest, ATF and Treasury.gov a lot too. But the uh, so I look at who reads me, because a lot of the people that you're reaching, and that's one of the things you see in comments, is <clears throat> I may engage in a comment, a comment discussion in which the person I'm chatting with and I are really at an impasse, but I'm writing for all the people that we call lurkers who are hanging in the metaphoric rafters who are reading it. And uh, most people who visit a blog don't comment because it, it's a scary thing to do. Uh, so I'm looking for who's visiting, how often do they visit, and i got ways of tracking a lot of that. And my message is being read by the people I want it to be read by as well as everybody else who's welcome to come by. Just a little scary if you don't like guns. It, the variation is tremendous, at least in political blogs, which I look into. I remember interviewing one political blogger whose blog I liked. I thought he was a very good writer, a very good thinker. And I said, well, how many people read your blog? He said, well, as far as I can tell, just me. But I like you doing it. And, you know, motivation is part of it. And he enjoyed it. Well, for him, it really was a diary. <laughs> he was the only person who was reading it. And, of course, people kept diaries for many years in the past and didn't have a large readership. It was only afterwards they were published. We have political blogs that are read by millions and definitely read by presidential candidates. And in fact, in the political sphere, uh, and maybe you might just want to uh, mention the mill blogging convention, because one of the ways you tell whether something has made it is the big important people by the traditional standards show up and pay homage to you. And maybe if you could talk about the mill blogging convention as an example. Of that. Well, two years ago, um, the lady who was one of the pioneers, Andy Hurley, um, organized the inaugural mill blogging conference, and that was 06. Um, we had a second one, and that was in Washington, D.C. We had a second one last year, last spring, again in D.C. And then a number of us participated in the Blog World Expo on the mill blogging track, which happened in Las Vegas back in, was that October? October. October. Um, and now we're going to make, or it looks like, and this is breaking information, so you guys are on the cutting edge of this very important stuff. Um, which is we're going to do the mill blogging conference coincident with Blog World Expo in Las Vegas in September of next year. So Rick Calvert is the guy who invented Blog World Expo, um, and he loves the fact that there is a mill blog presence because he understands all of the things that we've talked about in terms of mill blogging is a perfect example of the efficacy of blogging. So um, these have been huge. In fact, Last year's mill blogging conference was kicked off by the president, um, who had sent a DVD of him talking. It wasn't him really there, um, but it was kind of cool that you know you push play and here he is. You know, hi, mill bloggers, good to see you, right? And he, he talked for about a couple minutes. It was cool. Everybody was psyched up. Um, there was a rumor afoot that he was actually going to show up, um, but again, then John and I later got to sit down with him for uh, for an hour back in September. Um, which is a whole different story. But, uh, but yeah, the Mill Blogging Conference is getting bigger each year. It's, it's very uh, – mainstream media shows up. We had Fox News, CNN, Washington Post. Who else was there? I mean, they all want to cover it. They want to know what's on people's minds. They're very interested in what Jack's doing. You know, what is this bizarre thing where you go directly to bloggers and give them access to generals and military leaders and State Department officials? What is that? Right? So, you know, it's been, it's been good. I mean, it's grown fast. Something he didn't mention is we also had a direct video link with Rear Admiral Fox, the chief PAO, in the CENTCOM in Iraq. And we had a two-way conversation with him during the conference. And then going back to impact, <coughs> uh, the day before I had gone and spent two hours with Nancy Boyda talking about veterans' issues and some other things. And... <coughs> One of our problems we'd been having was getting access to military treatment facilities for Project Valor IT. We mentioned, I mentioned that deliberately at the Mill Blog Conference because we knew that guys like Jack Boss were there as well as Army PAO and others were, were paying attention to it. And sure enough, the next day at Walter Reed, as we're going around you know, giving out laptops to soldiers who need them, <coughs> The VA guys show up and the MedCom guys show up and they tell us, we'll fix your problem. We heard about it, da 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 It goes back to impact. And me, in the, I blog for <clears throat> as much for who I want to get to as I do for everybody else. 
Um, my name is Rauf. Uh, being a student of journalism, that's what I know in this highly competitive market of communication. Only those sources of uh, media or information can survive who ensure credibility. Uh, what do you think these blogs will maintain credibility in future to survive? Uh, particularly, Professor uh, Palmuter mentioned about blog war. Uh, like, to get to this status, do you think blogs would have enough credibility uh, as a source of uh, credible information? I can only speak for me personally. Uh, the mainstream media has various times been characterized by yellow journalism and everything else. Uh, credibility is earned and maintained and if you you can make a splash and you can get big and then you get big enough and you are not truly credible or you don't maintain your standards you will crash like a ton of bricks uh, I, I try to guard my uh, credibility zealously and when people point out that I've made an error of fact I verify that and I'll go back and change the post I won't rewrite it so it looks like I didn't make the error. I just stick an update in there going, subsequent information said John was wrong. Um, and engaging people honestly and directly. But it's, it's just like respect. And that's what credibility is. You have to gain it, you have to earn it, and then you have to maintain it. You can't just rely on it. I mean, that's a great question. I think the, the, the essence of the answer is why mill blogs have come into prominence. The reason mill bloggers got entree, and I'm not talking exactly through Jack's DOD new media outreach, I'm talking about John would get an email from a platoon leader who was out there actually doing it. This same platoon leader was introduced to a guy from the New York Times by his PAO and he sat down with him for a half hour and told him exactly what's going on. A day later he gets to see the report and it has nothing to do with what he told him. So that frustration continue, continues to well up it proliferates, guys are comparing notes to this guy, screw you two, yeah, and everybody gets ticked. And so you go, I got this guy who will take what we say and won't spin it, and that's a trite word to use, but you know, we can be assured that he's willing to accept what we say as fact, and he's not going to give it any pastiche that is counter to truth, right? So. That reality is what ensures credibility and accuracy, if you can cr maintain that dynamic. So he's as good as the last time he posted something that reflected the truth as it was being articulated by those guys in the field. Um, now, the other thing we haven't talked about here, like John says, if somebody tells him something's wrong, it's blog protocol to strike through it and then put the right thing, right? Not to repost it and go, well, you know, maybe nobody will notice. Um, but the other thing is the comments. You know, if you post something that's not true in good faith, um, but you're just wrong, your audience is going to correct you within 10 comments. So that's the thing that your traditional media doesn't get, right? They'll read the post and they'll go away. You don't want to read this great unwashed mass that has trouble with punctuation and spelling and maybe throws in an F-bomb every once in a while, right? The, you're not going there, the comments, that's like below the fold. But if you want to know what a blog's value is, you have to. You know, that's an important part. That's the other shoe dropping of a blog, is the audience. Um, and I like to throw questions to the audience at Defense Tech or introduce things that I know are going to get them fired up, not in an artificial way, but just because I, I want them to be part of the, the presentation. You know, you, you never, in fact, popular blogs are not about the blogger. Um, they're just a forum for people to weigh in. You know, they feel like they belong here, and if they don't show up, something's going to be amiss. You're going to miss something, you know. Um, I think this is something that any blogger that we know about has done has done well. Is that for me? I, I facilitate that two different ways. One is I learned quickly that I could write posts which answered every possible question, and nobody would comment. So now I write posts that leave gaps, sometimes, you know, low-hanging fruit, sometimes a little teaser, but something to encourage people who know something to jump in and expand on it. Then the other thing I do that a lot of bigger bloggers than I almost can't do is I have what I call the rules. And I don't, I don't allow the F-bomb. I don't allow people to just, if all you've got to say is you're a poopy head, don't say that. You know, that if that's your argument, I'm going to remove it. And I'll probably leave some snarky comment about it. But 
<clears throat> that creates a safer environment which encourages people to comment because they don't feel like they're immediately going to get piled on by a bunch of hooligans with more time than sense. Mike? Yeah. Uh, my question is for the whole group, and it's uh, based upon... Okay. My question is for the whole group, and it's based upon uh, extrapolation into the future. Uh, for example, the new FCC regulation, which allows the newspapers to uh, own uh, things they weren't allowed to own, other forms of media. Uh, and of course, in many ways, they, the newspapers already feel threatened by some of these developments. Could you extrapolate into the future, let's say the next year or so, or two or three, uh, up to eight or ten years, uh, where is all of this going and uh, uh, to what extent is the old newspaper thing just going to be basically gone? But that's not the most important thing. You know what the most important thing is, and I don't, so that's what I'm asking. Uh, you guys are more experienced, um, and I'm deeply appreciative of, of, of your answer. You know, at the end of the day, this is, this is a marketplace, and a marketplace that trades on public taste, so it's very capricious and fickle. So if I was to project five years out, there will be fewer mill blogs, but those that exist will be better read and, and have more clout and influence. Um, newspapers, um, I mean, I read it now, and, and it's sort of like what happened to Navy message traffic when Cipernet came online. Navy message traffic, hard copy messages that used to be gospel that you'd read every day, became sort of the traffic of record. It wasn't where you'd find out that you had a mission change or that something had happened, or even like a Red Cross message. Same thing with the Washington Post. You know, because I'm posting news and I'm plugged into the news 24 hours a day, literally, when I wake up in the morning um, and I read the Washington Post, it's, I know everything already. I don't learn. In fact, they're lagging what I've already posted for the morning news at military.com. You know, so maybe I can get a little more opinion, a little more context. Um, but I'm not going to the Washington Post to find out breaking news, right? So does that mean they're becoming less relevant? I think maybe, to some degree, right? It's certainly not the only source of news as it once was, say, a decade ago, right? So, I mean, blogs will continue to grow, and, uh, and good ones will continue to flourish. And as traditional media becomes more accepting of the idea of blogs, maybe they'll co-opt them, you know, I mean... Military.com was in the acquisitions phase of blogs last year. We bought four blogs. Um, and uh, four blogs, we bought them. We own, Military.com owns four blogs, um, including Defense Tech, and a blog called Spouse Buzz, which is uh, aimed at a virtual sort of wives club um, sort of thing. So they're not going anywhere. There will be fewer of them. And uh, the other thing about it is uh, the question that remains unanswered is when you have an administration change and there's less chaos around a president, um, what will that do to the impetus behind bloggers, you know, behind what, what motivates you to blog? Uh, will that wane? It, it, will, it, will the national dialogue settle down a little bit? Um, I don't know. It, it, may, it might. And if so, then, then no blogs... Uh, besides those that are just talking about what's going on out in the field, um, will have reduced impact. I agree with that. The, uh, my mental picture for that is like the automobile industry. In the 20s and 30s, there was Packard, there was Rio, there was all, and, and all those nameplates that are now owned by General Motors or Chrysler or Ford were independent car manufacturers. Well, the new General Motors is getting started in the mill blogosphere as Ward and his guys uh, find high-quality content and integrate it into their brand. And then there's the curmudgeons like me who, just because he hasn't offered me enough, um, are, are sitting out there still doing it independently. And, uh, and there's going to be some consolidation. And from a mill block perspective, if the war winds down, uh, I've already seen this. 
I was at around 5,000 hits a day to, to 8,000 normal. And as the campaigns have ramped up and the surge started working, and so the, the, the war kind of dropped a little bit off of the uh, people's perspective, or radar screen, so to speak, my traffic is down. <clears throat> my base traffic of repeat visitors is up, but my Google visits are down because people aren't searching for the kind of things I talk about. And uh, I, I think that's going <clears> to... <throat> that's going to go on. The big difference is that you can still be a blogger. Unlike, you know, like Tucker who tried to start a car company on his own late in the business, you don't have those capital investment problems. You want to be a blogger, you can be a blogger. You're just going to have to fight with guys like me who've been at it for a while and who have the contacts and who therefore get the, the linkage from other bigger bloggers. You're going to have trouble breaking through a glass ceiling or a glass floor to us, but a ceiling to you. The other thing about it is the utility of blogs is going to shift. Right now, the utility of blogs, or in the last four years, the utility of blogs has been to explain to an audience that doesn't believe they're getting the truth of what's going on in the war, the facts of the war. Okay, so as the surge works, we retrograde, or we reconstitute back stateside, and we, it becomes more of a presence op and not so much a hot war. There will be issues. There will be issues about VA benefits, about the GI Bill isn't enough. There will be issues about PTSD and traumatic brain injury and family reintegration and retention. Retention is going to be a huge issue in the next five years. Not so much recruiting, but retention of your mid-grade NCOs and your mid-grade officers, those who've done three and four rotations and see no end in sight in this op tempo, except the call to action has waned, right? All of the rallying cries post 9-11 have, have, have petered off. And now it's just you're going to be gone for 15 months, you know? Um, so there will be a, a reason, there will be utility behind mill blogs. Mill blogs will be keeping lawmakers' feet to the fire about supporting those that did the nation's bidding. They answered the call. Now we've got to protect them. We've got to give them their rights, their benefits, their education, all the things we promised, right? That's not going to happen without mill blogs keeping their feet to the fire. So they'll be around. They'll just change from one topic to another. Because the national dialogue, the focus is going to change. One of the reasons why I'm here, <clears throat> I take a, a more macro view of a lot of this stuff. Uh, and what we're going to see in the future are the things that these kids are coming out of Kansas University, poli-sci majors, who are dealing in some of these things, the communication majors, the journalism majors who are coming out who will be entering the workforce, who will be over the next 10, 15, 20 years taking over these companies. And as long as one of the interesting things about, uh, about for example, newspapers, they are extremely profitable businesses. Even though their readership is declining and the way they do business is declining, their business model isn't working except for the simple fact that they still make a lot of money. So somewhere along the line, they're going to be reinvesting that money in different technologies. Will it be co-opting, buying blogs, buying, you know, at, at, hiring them as independent writers or as staff writers? Who knows? The people that will be making those decisions are sitting in these classrooms right now. So as this develops, these are the things that, that we look for. How do we position ourselves for that future? Gentlemen, we've run out of time, but thank you very much. Thank you for your service to your readers as well as the, the country. The wonderful thing about blogging is that the conversation continues. The Dole Institute has its own blog. These gentlemen have posted comments, I'm sorry, have put up posts there that you can respond to, and we invite you to continue the conversation. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you.